Good afternoon, all. This is a question that I wouldn't normally ask you because you notice here lately with a lot of these game shows that the first thing they ask the person after they win something, what you gonna do with that money? That's so ridiculous to me. That's like asking someone with your paycheck what you're gonna do with that money. I'm gonna pay your bills. That's the, the first assumption anyway. I won't even get into the title right now because it was very similar. And this way you will follow along to detect that similarity. But believe me, the question is not going to be asked by the father because he already knows. Mm -hmm. We'll start with Acts, the first chapter, the sixth verse. Then indeed, these coming together, they asked him, saying, Master, do you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Another stupid question. <laughs> and he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons. He's very direct, as you see. And we should be too. <laughs> for that other question. And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power, the Holy Spirit coming upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You're telling me here, if you don't see it for yourself, he is at one time going to be in control of the whole earth. Verse 9. And saying these things, as they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they were looking intently, intently into the heavens, he having gone, even behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them, who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into the heavens? This same Yeshua, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the, in the way you have seen him go into heaven. And he will. The world doesn't think so, but he will. It is prophesied. As people of Elohim, we have lived our lives up to this point in anticipation of the return of Yeshua Messiah. Our lives have been completely focused, well, they should be anyway, on this event. We have made many sacrifices. We have put and allocated our physical substance to it. We have built the entire schedule of our lives around the timetables that Elohim instituted for us. The Sabbath, 
the Passover, the days of unleavened bread, and continuing on through the holy days. As Christ promised in Acts 1, when he left his disciples, he sent his Holy Spirit back to them in a rushing mighty wind in Acts 2. Verse 1. You've read it. You know it. Some say that this was the beginning of the New Testament church. The book says that the Feast of Trumpets is this day that we believe he will return in power. And some are confused about that also. He will return in power, saving the world from itself. We fast yearly on the Day of Atonement. If you can, you do it more than once a year. Showing Christ that without him, we would have nothing. We would do nothing. We would be nothing. And we end our year celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles, which depicts, depicts the millennium, 1,000 years when evil will be put down for a season, a time to prove for all time that Yahweh Elohim's way is the only way. Yet we all have endured the struggles and strife that seem to go hand in hand with this way of life. Some of us have fallen out of favor with our families as we walk down this road. I've heard great many stories of families in turmoil simply for following the word of Elohim. Some of us have stumbled along the way because of these family pressures. But most of us have struggled to our feet, lifted the sometimes blood-stained banner, and carried on. Others have given up and given in to the call of the world, no longer continuing on. Still others have decided that this way is too structured. And because of the many years when nothing seems to have happened prophetically, some believe that Elohim is no longer concerned with what we do down here. So they feel that we don't have to focus so much on the details of scripture only love each other, that's hard enough. What I see anyway, and follow Christ. And they have followed him from the Sabbath straight to Sunday. <laughs> and I, I, I feel no need to elaborate on that. You see it all around you. But there is, however, a promise. We find that promise in Revelation, the 20th chapter, the sixth verse. Revelation, the 20th chapter, the sixth verse. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. The second death has no authority over these. But they will be priests of Yahweh and of Christ and will reign with him 1,000 years. That's hard enough to imagine right there. But if you believe it, 
that was the natural lifespan that he intended for us from the beginning. Look at the lifespans of those of the book of Genesis. Almost a thousand years in most cases. And those who don't believe it, read through Genesis and you'll have your answer. However, when Christ comes back, he will reward us with a measure of power that we are unable to comprehend as mortals. We imagine that we can grasp it, but I'm not sure that's possible so long as we are in this flesh. For title, we will call this if you remember that first question, what will you do with your power? <laughs> Forgotten already, huh? What will you do with your money? <laughs> to bring it together. Eternal life eternal life. Let that one bounce around in your mind for a while. Realistically, it can frighten you as a mortal when you fully think about all the implications of it. It can be just as frightening as death if you only approach it from a human perspective which right now is the only one that we can realistically approach it from. The thousand years is hard enough for us to imagine. Ecclesiastes, the third chapter, the 11th verse, proves that. Ecclesiastes, the third chapter, the 11th verse. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the hearts of men. Who did it? Yes. You didn't even do that for yourself. You can't uh, apprehend that mentally without his help. Yet, we cannot fathom what Elohim has done from beginning to end. Elohim put eternity in our minds. We know we can't attain it. Of ourselves by any means. Science has made attempts. <laughs> attempts hyperbaric chambers for freezing the bodies of rich men, that's the only ones that can afford it, until cures are found for their diseases. Whatever that disease was, when they defrost you and come back, if they haven't still got a cure for that disease, you're gonna die again anyway. That's the kind of thinking that we have as humans. We don't want to solve the problem because you're going to want to make money off of it later on. Cloning is being toyed with. They've already cloned sheep and other animals in England and China. The Japanese have already swiped the technology in Wealthy Japanese are eating beef from cloned cows. This was 10 years ago. The implication of this practice, as om ominous as they are, we don't know what could happen from that meat. 
Well, they haven't given up on the idea yet. Of course, Bill Gates has placed his hat in that ring with his impossible burger. <laughs> made, of, made of fake meat products. Scientists say that the only way to make a better future for all, for the most part, is this fake meat. I was looking last night at the statistics. Right now, that fake meat will improve 2% of the um, atmosphere. Two percent. The, the best way to do that, though, 55% will be replaced if you replace the car. And the other 45%, if you replace all the factories that dot the lot, dot the earth. But that way, a lot of rich people won't be rich anymore. This is all about money, after all. See it for what it is or don't see it at all. No one wants to die, but they don't have sufficient trust in Elohim to leave it all in his hands. But there is a promise of a forever life on the table, but we only get it if we obey the word of the Almighty. We can't truly wrap our minds around the concept. In your solitude, try it sometime. It'll give you night sweats. There is a whole discipline of psychology dedicated to, to people with severe bouts of necrophobia. Not negrophobia, that's something else. Mm -hmm. What is necrophobia? In clinical terms, it is the abject fear of death. So much as it is a fear of a <coughs> life beyond your control, that's what it really is. The human mind cannot grasp the concept of not existing. It isn't designed for that. It will, it really, ri originally, it was designed to last forever under the control of Elohim. But that's why that control was never developed in the human mind because it wasn't supposed to get to that stage. It knows it'll happen, but it has no natural mechanism to cope with it. But it knows no physical way that it can cope with it. The mind has no trouble intellectually grasping the concept of not existing on a subconscious level but it cannot correctly convey that concept back to your conscious mind. The conscious mind can't handle it. There have been autopsies done on people who have jumped from high-rise buildings. That listed the cause of death as congestive heart failure or stroke. Essentially, when faced with the 
the reality of the end, the body simply shuts off. The person was dead before they ever hit the ground. As I said, the conscious mind can't handle it. The design wasn't put in because that wasn't what he had in mind for you. Consider for a minute your concept of death. Probably the last time you ever thought about it with any consideration was in your youth. When it wasn't so real to you. You think about it a lot more now, but you think about it a different way because now it's a little bit re more real to you. But by now, you know that there's no way of, to avoid it. But now you're thinking a little bit more about that plan that God put in your head when you were young, younger. In those days when everything worked and nothing hurt, <laughs> when you had all the answers and your parents were idiots and just didn't understand, you remember that, huh? They just didn't understand. Because you knew everything then. You probably sat in a room, a dark room with the lights out, turned off anything that made noise, lay down on your bed, closed your eyes and imagined the unimaginable for about four minutes. Any longer than that, and you jump up, shaking and turn on lights and looking for something else to do. But it wasn't the idea of nothingness that made you jump up. It was the concept of being in that per position interminably, forever, unable to move, in the dark, alone. I'll stop. I'll stop. Now, we know that we won't be conscious, but try to get the mind to wrap around that. As I said before, it can't do it. That part of design, he never put it in the mind. That's why you can't do it. And that is why simple theological answers don't work. Simple answers only work for people who take eternity lightly. And I hope that's none of us. I'll tell you why. Because that how most of the world views religion. It's just something to do in case there is something out there. A real God, small g, or something. Some of us are devout. Most only see it as a sort of cosmic spiritual life insurance policy, though. Man won't commit beyond that, as there is too much fun being had out here in the world. Too much illicit whatever. You imagine your own. I look at this stuff 10 years later and some of the stuff that I penciled in here, it isn't even relevant to me anymore. And you all are a lot smarter than I was 10 years ago. <laughs> and I erased that stuff because I'm thinking of 
different things now. And the things I'm thinking about is as stupid as the stuff that I got here. And I don't even want to use that. <laughs> Besides, the prevalent wisdom in modern theology is that we have immortal souls and we'll live forever anyway. Why bother with fealty to or obedience to a cosmic capital G O D? That's the mainstream fundamentalist vision. If you die, you either go to heaven to be with the angels where you will sit there and play harps and sing praise of sing praises of Yahweh the Father and Yeshua oh and Mary that's the prevalent vision now because the Catholic Church is slowly gathering their power again you can't have a forever life without Mary. Look into it on your own. Don't too much time with that because it's not real. And of course, no one has anything to do with that for eternity, but sit around and listening to harp music all day. The only alternative is you go to hell to be whipped forever with a cat of nine tails in a 10,000 degree blast furnace at the center of the earth forever. In the logic of the carnal mind, why should he or she attend church? or obey not only Yahweh, but anyone. No one obeys rules anymore. Stop at a stoplight recently. How many cars go through them now regularly? Nobody wants to obey any rules, not only the Ten Commandments, they can't even obey a stoplight stop now. Either way it goes, in their minds, they live on forever. Not a great life, but better than nothingness. But can you really trust the world's opinion? Especially after the way that their minds flummox yours on this COVID-19 thing. I'll see if they catch that one. <laughs> Before they do, turn to Second Peter, the third chapter, the eighth verse. to get to reality. Second Peter, the third chapter, the eighth verse. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the sovereign Elohim, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The master is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. To Yahweh, time is no big deal. That's our whole thing. He's taking too long. In actuality, to him, time is something of an illusion. It never ends for him. You haven't gotten that point yet. 
to that point yet. And let's get to that point. No one has an immortal soul. No one is in heaven. All are in their graves. More proof? John, the third chapter, the 13th verse. John, the third chapter, the 13th verse. No one, who? <coughs> no one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. If you want one day more than the three score and ten you're allowed, and most of us don't even get that anymore because the atmosphere is so polluted already. And nobody's going to clean that up for you because now they've got the idea in their heads that eight billion people is too many. All the little charts and stuff that I developed say that the world after he evens things out will comfortably house 60 billion people. <clears throat> Their reason for limiting it to three, three billion is that's a controllable amount of people. It's a controlled thing. I don't want to say that it's Charles Schwab's numbers, Klaus Schwab's numbers, but that's who it's pointing to. If you want one day more than the three, thousand, three score and 10 you're allowed, you're going to have to go to the Father. And that's not Klaus Schwab. Come to the Father through the Son. After we have been baptized and are in the faith, This is expected. And we also know that the road is hard. And we all know that we didn't get here all at once. It was, and by the way, still is a hard road. I'm in lights. But occasionally, when new people come in, there is a tendency to expect them to come in all cleaned up and full of a great knowledge of the truths of Yahweh already. They shouldn't have any bad habits, no offensive traits. They should just come in and fit right in and be perfect as we are. Right? Yes. Hmm. And unfortunately, that's the attitude that keeps our churches small enough to be in somebody's basement. And there's still room left over for more. <laughs> hmm. How many of you have been into a corner bar lately. Shh. Don't raise your hands. <laughs> don't, don't let everyone know. When you go into your 
local watering hole or night spot. Just notice how everyone just seems to float in and talk to each other and they get along and well, at least until excess kicks in anyway. But there's, that's not my point. Notice that at some point though, the slump shouldered and troubled always seem to find their way to the bar. And a funny thing happens at the bar those people will start a conversation with the bartender that is amazing. I used to make part of my living at this, not at the, at the bartender, never did that. That's one of the few things I haven't done. <laughs> but most bartenders seem to accept it and somehow are prepared for it. And in my experience, people will tell a bartender things that they won't tell their wives or husbands. <laughs> and the bartender listens, as he has most likely heard it all before, and is not quick to condemn. Now notice, I didn't say judge. The two tend to be horribly confused and can mean the difference between repentance and walking out the door with no answers. A bartender has to judge whether this person wants advice or just wants to vent. And most people just want to get it off of their chest. They want to talk. But what is equally interesting is how many people will actually take the advice of a bartender before they will take the advice of a minister or a brother or sister in Christ. The attitude seems to be the difference. Now it seems to me that on some level a local church, or at least a home church, should seem at least as welcoming to the lowly and downhearted as a local bar. Without the worldly distractions, of course. As people of Yahweh, we should know right from wrong, as taught in the scriptures. We also should know that after a new convert or potential member comes in, they will never come in perfect. We should be there as brothers and sisters in Christ to teach what the word says biblically. And by example, as they go along, correcting gently but not condemning them when they are wrong. For not being where we perceive ourselves to be. There is a lot of work, work to be done in the world to come and Yahweh Elohim wants everyone he calls to be involved. And he wants those of us who have been here a while to show the way to the new ones that he calls. You can't do that with a chip on your shoulder. And you can't do that with all the answers and none of the questions on your shoulder. In other words, you have to get yourself calmed down to the point where you're not knowing everything, but you know something.
somehow get the stuff that you know into that person without hurting their feelings so bad that they walk away. We find the way to do that in Colossians, the third chapter, the 16th verse. Colossians, the third chapter, the 16th verse. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to yourself, no, Yahweh Elohim, it's not about you. And a lot of us get to a point where we know so much, we want to take over everything. That's not a good thing to do, especially if you're not qualified. And most of us, including speaker, don't know everything. You don't know everything. Even if you do, you're bound to slip up somewhere in you teaching it to somebody else if you're looking down on them while you do it. Continuing in Titus, the second chapter, the fourth, first verse. Titus, the second chapter, the first verse. But as for you, I saw that line and I thought about one of um, Sandra's uncles. He used to come in the door. Not only you, <laughs> but as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, Sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, or slaves to much wine, but are to teach what is good. And so train the young women to love their husbands. And that's sometimes a difficult thing, but you have to do that. And children. That one got me at one point. Train you to love your children? We thought that was kind of cool because most women, when they first put that baby on your chest, and it's kind of automatic at that point. Mm -hmm. And I remember what happened as they got older and that balanced out a little bit. But you still have to love your husbands and children. Verse five, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands. <clears throat> that the word of Yahweh may not be reviled. Believe me, there will be decades of work to do for us all. We can only imagine what we will be doing on into eternity. But one thing's for sure, leisure will only be a part of it. It won't be 
the, more, the majority of the deal. We will rest for sure on the Sabbath, but the other six days, that's going to be some work but not the kind of busy work that jobs have you doing now. There isn't a lot of detail in the Bible about what you will be doing, but there is one big hint. In Revelation, the 21st chapter, the fifth verse. Revelation, the 21st chapter, the fifth verse. And he who was seated on the throne said, here's the big hint. Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. Behold, I make all things new. All things new. What does that mean? All new planets? A new solar system? Constructed of different materials? Different atmospheres? All that car smoke out of the atmosphere will make us live a lot longer? different species. Well, that one might be a problem for some of us. <clears throat> Even colors confuse us sometimes. Listen, how many of you are Trekkies? Two, two, three and a half, <laughs> three and a half, three and a half. Three and a half. A half. <laughs> Three and a half. If you looked at Star Trek, that species thing, they had all kinds. One of my pers personal favorites was the Ferengis. They were funny. <laughs> they look funny too. But they were funny. Yep, that book of rules that they had about business, mm -hmm. hundred and something rules about business, and they, anybody that they ran into, they had to go through that test of whether or not you could do business with them. If you can do business with them, live with them. And after a while, I understood within myself that the Ferengi resented, re represented modern corporate interest. And everything on that program reflected something real in real life. In other words, you can learn a lot from Star Trek. I'm not advertising for anything, but the stuff is there. Use it. <laughs> different atmospheres, different species, maybe not carbon-based this time. Maybe something more ethereal than even spirit. The mind boggles. Remember he said all things. This is a scripture that we read over and over again and never fully understand. Let's not read that one again. I got a new one for you. Isaiah, the 45th chapter, the 18th verse. He said it a little differently here. And he puts his period on this one. Isaiah, the 45th chapter, the 18th verse. For this is what Yahweh Elohim says. 
He who created the heavens, he is Yahweh. He who fashioned and made the earth, he founded it. He did not create it to be empty. My mind boggles. But formed it to be inhabited. He says, I am Yahweh. There is that famous period. And there is no other. Again and again, Yahweh reaffirms that he created the heavens and the earth. And he says that he formed both of them to be inhabited. So I guess now we know that there will be plenty to do in eternity. Yahweh has plenty of power and authority that he wants to bestow upon us. He has work that he wants us to do. But Yahweh wants us to start here with our brethren. <coughs> That's the best proving ground in the world. And eventually, the rest of the universe. But he needs to know that he can trust us with more. And he has not patience for another Satan. Say it again. He has not the patience or the facility for another Satan. Matthew, the 25th chapter, the 14th verse. Matthew, the 25th chapter, the 14th verse. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. The one he gave five talents to, another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. Sound familiar yet? Verse 16, he who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them and made five talents more. Sounds like a Ferengi, huh? <laughs> 17. So also, he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he had received the one talent, went and dug, dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done! good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also said, who had the two talents came forward. Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here, I have made two talents more. Ferengis are doing very well in the new, <laughs> in the new system. <laughs> His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. 
I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward. Uh-oh. Saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid. So many times in the Bible, it says something about not being afraid, doesn't it? And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I had not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. Yeah, yeah. Those were bankers back then, not the ones now. They had a way to make money from thin air back then. They didn't have that back then. They didn't have that back then. If they did, we didn't hear about it. 27, then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. That is a interesting twist of events because this is actually a parable. Twenty-eight. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given and he will have an abundance. And for the one who has not even what he has has will be taken away and cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. We have to start here. We are being judged by what we do right here right now. Yahweh wants to see what we do with the little power that he gave us with the seedling of his spirit that we received at baptism. Then he will give us full power in powerful bodies at Christ's coming. Not until then. He wants to see what our attitudes will be toward the world as it goes careening off the rails in this 21st century. He wants to see if we will continue to trust in him and his word as others abandon it. He wants to see if you will continue to read the Bible and believe it and live by it until he comes. And one day, Christ will return to claim his rightful place on the throne. He will come and imbue us all with power and authority. And that will leave me with just one question. He will ask you then, I ask you now, what will you do with your power? Any questions? Any comments? Uh, so I had something, and you, uh, you 
talking about how to run my approach handling uh, the eternity. Mm -hmm. What about something that's written in Job, uh, Job chapter 14, uh, verse 14 to 15. I thought this was an interesting uh, way to look at it. Job 14, 14 and 15. Mm -hmm. And it's written here, um, If a man die, shall he live again? All the days of my hard service, I will wait till my change comes. Mm. You shall call and I shall answer you. You shall desire the work of your hands. So he understood that he would die. Mm -hmm. and that one day Yahweh would come for him. Mm -hmm. And him being the work of his hands. Mm -hmm. And he said he would wait until his change comes. Yep. So I thought that was a, maybe a, something we could do. Yep. When we try to uh, approach the concept of uh, dealing with eternity. Mm-hmm. Little pieces are all through the book, but he didn't say it out loud for everybody to hear it. You got to get into the book a little bit. That was his little hook. Could get you into the book, right? But some people didn't get it because they don't read the book enough. Any more? I did another thought when you were talking about. Uh Mothers being um, taught to love their children. I know mm -hmm. that a mother has a natural nurturing instinct. Usually. And then uh, there's a lot of times when you hear like talk shows and stuff talking about it, they always say that babies don't come with instruction manuals. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess it's a combination of the natural nurturing instinct and also the knowledge and uh, how to do the job maybe from other mothers that has to be involved in it too. Yep. Well, I guess there is some teaching that has to, has to go on. Well, yep. It's the grandmothers that are the wise. Mm -hmm. It's the great-grandmothers. Yeah, back then, you did have sometimes three or four generations in a house at the exactly. same time. Right. There was a reason for that. Right. Yep. There was a reason for that. They're the wise ones. Mm -hmm. We don't do that now because we so busy being pretending to be grown. Sandy. Are you asking the question, what will we do with our power once we get it? Yeah. Fully or yes. Okay. Okay. And you're not going to get it until you prove to him that you can handle it. We hope that we use it wisely. Mm -hmm. There's no hope for that because if you don't sow him efficiently enough before he gives it to you, you ain't gonna get it. Mm -hmm. Take you back and off of that just a little bit. You know, sometimes our small acts of kindness can have an effect on a person that is phenomenal in that person's life. We might not know it, so you know, uh, the Father's given us spiritual gifts now that we're supposed to use to help equip, you know, help equip the church and everything. But there's a lot of things we can do now. And we might think it's insignificant, you know, but it just might make the, uh, somebody's whole day. A little small yep. kindness and you know things yeah, like that. That is true. Yeah. Yes, yeah, there much, there much, there is a lot there yes, to be unloaded. <coughs> Develop. Uh, you was talking about the eternity in your mind is so true. Mm-hmm. It does. Mm-hmm. Eternity in your mind. That is component true. isn't there. Right. Right. Even that yeah. was intentional. Yeah. And what Thurman was saying. Sometimes a little kind word or thought, or you call somebody, how you doing, you know, or what you doing, it helps them, you know, it might help them through the day. You never know. Mm -hmm. But my mother used to say, when you keep thinking about somebody, you would call, maybe something's going on. Yep. Yes, sir. What's happening? What's happening? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll reverse reserve that spot she she put up her hand and then the doorbell rang yes Jerry that's what he's concentrating on right. what we have right now Oftentimes, you know, co-workers or just someone in general, they may begin just to hold a, a conversation 
and, and you just listen intently, and the Holy Spirit will guide you to what to say. They may just walk past you, and, and you can look at that person, and or, or they may just say something, and not your words, but the Holy Spirit will give you those words just to utter, and it will make a difference, just a little bit, but it makes a big difference. Yeah. If we just take the time to listen, not to hear, but to listen, right. mm -hmm. and to give an encouraging word along the way, it really helps. And the Father will teach us how to do that more. To mm -hmm. listen, to take the time. Yep. Because with, you know, as you stated, the world is moving so quickly on this axle to the world, and we just hear a certain conversation, or they just may brush by you, and you just say, "Come oh, on." And you don't know what, what that can make someone feel like. Just for that, that moment. They don't know what their day was. You know? Yeah. Just in kind words. Sometimes it makes a difference. You need to talk to somebody. Just to talk to do it out. Yep. Well, Lena. Uh, I was just thinking about what, what, what Thurman was saying about uh, Joe and Joe knew. Mm hmm. Uh, that he was going to be changed, and and I thought about the scripture that's in I mean, that's in Philippians, the first chapter and verse six, where it says, "And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ." So he's going to finish the work that he oh, yeah. done. Enough. If we stand fast in him, if we stand fast. Mm -hmm. Why certain things aren't going to happen until we change because he's not going to give you that power until he's 100% convinced that you have earned it mm -hmm. at that time. He knows who's mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. Ruby. Ruby. I remember when I used to work, I used to have opportunities to talk to colleagues and share the word. And now that I've no longer worked, I was watching a program last night regarding being kind to one another and sharing and doing. And it made me reflect on what you said. That what are we gonna do when we get that? You know, that power mm -hmm. of, of teaching. And I said to myself, I'm in a pause, maybe it's because I needed to work on myself. Mm -hmm. I had to understand the word in order for me to share because I have no one to do this anymore. And even with my kids, very seldom they hear little words here and there. But it, it just made me reflect and think of because I, I'm at home now. What do I do? And uh, it, it just made me think. It really made me think. I'm like, uh oh. Well, where do I stand now? Mm -hmm. You know, even when my cousin talks, like this morning I spoke to her and she had my own and she had so much to say. And I try to give her words of encouragement, but when, when I hear my beloved families here at ABCLG that are out there working and <coughs> in person, you know, they have this communication that they're able to share. And I said, oh my gosh, in my mind I'm thinking, what am I doing? But then I had to stop and think of Father. So then he started thinking of it, thinking, what am I here for? Thinking mm -hmm. that the mind starts to play games mm -hmm. in me. Because mm -hmm. I'm not out there anymore. Mm -hmm. But it's going to make me want to read his word even more. Mm -hmm. So I could try to defend his word when they come at me and say, hey, Ruby, mm -hmm. why don't you visit it? You know, this way I could come to them in a gentle spirit now. And like Sister Sherry said, to listen, because anybody can hear, but who's really listening? Listening is actually taking in every word and dissecting it to understand where that person is at. And, and I think that's probably where I'm at now. For I, I need to start listening. And I thank the Father for this, because it just made me really There was a book I read a long time ago. And it said that most people that didn't break it down into gender, they did, but not the way that most people do. But 
The thing is, most people, any kind of people, there's only two kinds of people. <laughs> and both kinds of people, instead of listening, they're listening for the response that they come up with instead of listening to you talking. And they're listening in their head to what you're saying for key things that they can come back on you with to win the argument. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that so many times in my life and people don't even listen to you while you're talking. And they're like, they're with you. Sandy. You know, listen to Ruby made this statement. I never really thought about the fact that I am in a household with all the leaders. Mm -hmm. I never really thought about that mm -hmm. until you just made that statement. Mm -hmm. So that means I probably have taken that for granted and I, I, I'm so sorry for doing so. Mm -hmm. You know, even with having Elena, mm -hmm. Elena, Rashida, Mary, and myself, we're all believers. Mm -hmm. And it makes it easier yes. as you forget about those, like with you being by yourself. Not having anyone that's walking the way you're walking now, how hard it must be mm -hmm. to, you know, even having someone to share with, to, 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 you know, to share, mm -hmm. you know, just general conversations, mm -hmm. you know, just in general, you know, because, you know, if people are not where you are, they don't want to hear you talking about, you know, mm -hmm. God all day or mm -hmm. talking about certain things all day or whatever. Uh, so. I am so sorry that I have taken that for granted because I did, it did not register to me until you just made that statement. I said, wow, I am actually in the household with all the leaders. You know, a, a perfect example last night, our pipes been messing up again in the bathroom. And finally, Jean-Luc was able to rent one for 75 uh, feet of a slip to go into. And all I heard was a customer. Mm -hmm. Mother effort, and they said, what is it? And kicking and stuff. And all I did was sit there and I'm thinking, auditing them out and acting. And, and Jean Luc afterwards, because I even Alexander, and I said, Jean Luc Alexander, stop. Mm -hmm. You could express a frustration without all that filth in your mouth. Mm -hmm. And then they have it all on it. And then my husband says, well, you know, they're frustrated. I said, there's other ways. Mm -hmm. And they said, Mom, you just don't understand. You and mm -hmm. you have your way of doing things. And, and, and it ate to me. And I sat there and I said to myself, when will they hear me? They, they hear me, but they're not listening to me. As Sister Sherry said, listening is so important. It's vital to help each other out. And I sat there, and Ray said to me, what's wrong, then?" And I says, I don't like that my household is so disruptive. He said, but you know, they're just kids. I said, no, you know better. When you know better, you do better. And you can't keep on uh, pacifying that, because then they think it's OK. As parents, mm -hmm. we have a big role that we have to take up. So our children could see, but they see you one way and they said, I don't mean to knock you down, but I'm so knocked down myself that I'm, I'm, I'm drowning mm -hmm. and I can't seem to focus because everybody's disrupted and I'm trying, I'm trying. And, and just maybe just that word of listening, maybe the father wants me to listen, I'm trying to ask the father, what? What is it? Show me. And I always says, Father, if we could be in the days of old, present yourself, bring an angel, a disguise, just tell me. I, I, I need to hear it because our, our minds go crazy. I, I, I just need to hear someone that says, I got you. My son and daughter do the same thing. This is what I've done. But I don't have that. I don't. And I ate so bad. And last night was last night was really, really hard for me. 
because it was it had already entered the Sabbath and then and I felt so stuck. So stuck. And I says, Father, thank you. And at the end John looks at Ma, we finally got it done. And I said, Thank the Father. And he just goes, Yup. I says, Father, let me not see nothing. And I'm constantly asking the Father, seal my lips. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tighten his tongue where it doesn't say anything to offend or hurt no, because I'm trying to get it better. Because I, I, because I feel my tongue, if I explode, then that's an easy way to say, yes. see mom, yeah. you cuss, mm -hmm. see mom, you did this, and it's not bad. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. hard. Back to square one. Exactly. What is that association? You're around the same things. It's it's hard to change when that's all you see. That's why I get so excited when I'm at APCOG because I have like minds that think the same, that share the same, that have somehow a struggle where we can share to uplift each other. Mm -hmm. and, uh, if they weren't for that, I don't think where I don't know where I would be at. I really don't. And it scares me. It does. Any more? Thurman. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We're all done. <laughs> <laughs> Any more? I'm done. Okay, perfect. All right. It's 25. Thank you. All righty. If we're coming, yeah. Can I just read something right here? Sure. Yeah. Psalms 14 and 19, it says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation